The San Antonio Spurs have done it again. Uh, this is the third time in the last 25 years that we got the number one draft pick. Now, I've been a lifelong Spurs fan since 1999. So I guess that's not lifelong because uh, while Michael Jordan was still in the league, I was a Michael Jordan fan. I would call myself a Bulls fan back then, but if I'm keeping it real, I was a Michael Jordan fan when he left. I moved on very quickly. Uh, in 99, the year after his retirement, I, I decided I was a Spurs fan. I've never looked back. And I came in at the perfect time. 99, they won their first championship. They won four more over the next 20 years. They were the most dominant dynasty in the sports world, possibly ever. I mean, what they accomplished, winning seasons, always making the playoffs, always being viable championship contenders. There were a couple of other championship years. I'm thinking about 2013, I believe, where if Ray Allen doesn't hit a crazy three-pointer, we get the championship that year. I believe we also would have won in, I think it was 2016 when Kawhi got hurt, uh, really dirty play versus the Warriors. All that to say, the Spurs built a massive dynasty and it kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, the year before... Uh, Greg Popovich took over, or I think actually his first year, they only won 20 games. And uh, they got the first round pick pretty soon with David Robinson. A few years later, after Robinson's injury, they got Tim Duncan, one of the most dominant players ever in NBA history. And we went on this unbelievable 20 year run. It was so much fun to be a part of. And you don't really understand, unless you live in San Antonio, uh, like I do, how crazy San Antonians are about their Spurs. Um, I am so blessed that God brought me and my family to San Antonio for many reasons. It became home very, very quickly for us. But I was also so excited because I grew up all over the country, and yet I was a Spurs fan from uh, a pretty young age. And so being here with the Spurs, getting to go to games, seeing the Spurs around town sometimes, it is so, so much fun. And we don't take it for granted. In the last five years have been a huge shift for us. I mean, we have not been good and it's been really discouraging. And as a Spurs fan, like we don't really even know what to do with that. We are used to just being, you know, a 50 or 60 win team every year, playoffs every year. And people started to wonder and maybe even doubt a little bit uh, whether or not the Spurs had a future plan and where we were going. And I think that was really wrong uh, of any of us who did have those doubts because again and again, Greg Popovich and the front office, the management of the Spurs have shown that they know how to build a dynasty. And so we now have the number one draft pick, which some of that is luck, right? In the lottery system for the draft. However, we have in this draft in particular, um, what they're calling really a generational talent. Some people who know a lot better than I do, who have been scouting NBA prospects for decades and decades are saying, this might be the greatest NBA prospect since LeBron James. Some are saying this is the greatest NBA prospect ever, period. Uh, and at least one has even said that this may be the greatest prospect in any sport ever. Okay, so that's a lot of weight and pressure on this young man, Victor Wimbayanas. Uh, I'm going to have to learn how to say his name better. Uh, on his shoulders, that's a lot of pressure. And uh, We'll see, man. He's seven foot five, which, and he's very skinny. He's fragile, maybe. Um, Guys that are that big usually have health problems. We'll see. But not only do we get Victor in this draft, but next draft, 2024, we have a protected lottery pick. So we get a top four pick in another first round. 2025, we have a protected first six pick, somewhere in the first six, and a second first round. So we have the ability with all of these options in our hands and all of these draft choices and a lot of money in the bank because we have these young players that we're not having to pay a lot right now to build, to build relatively fast and to build something that could turn into another dynasty and to be in that position with just a five-year gap, 20 years of dominance, then five years of rebuilding back to what could potentially be another huge run, the mentorship of Tim Duncan, Manu, Tony Parker, all of this around him, the, the Spurs fan base, the environment, all of it. I mean, we could be looking at something unprecedented in sports. And so the question is, how do you do it? How do you build a dynasty? How do you build greatness, whether it's in sports, whether it's in your family, leaving behind a legacy and a lineage, whether it is in the business world, whether it is spiritually and in your faith, how do you build this dynastic, long lasting thing? Uh, many things can lead to a short season of victory. And we see this in the NBA. Uh, we see teams putting together super teams. You know, Miami grabs Chris Bosh and LeBron James to join Dwayne Wade. And they're great, you know, for five years. And they actually underperform. I mean, they get beat by the Mavericks out of, out of nowhere, you know, who have like Dirk Nowitzki and a bunch of, you know, ex-janitors on the team. Like, 
That was crazy. You know, they, they, they should have gone five for five or whatever. You see this in the Lakers. The Lakers, after they had this great run with Kobe and Shaq, they started having this mentality like we got to win and we got to win yesterday. And so we just got to build it as quickly as we can. That's when you saw the crazy teams like Carl Malone, Gary Payton, Kobe Bryant, like all these random assortments. Dwight Howard kind of passed his prime coming in. A meta world peace run our test, you know, coming in. All of these crazy cobbled together teams to try to win and win right now. Many things can lead to a short season of victory, but there is one thing that is required to build a dynasty. One thing that you have to have if you're going to have sustained long-term greatness, and that is vision. We see this when you look through the course of history of civilizations. You see a, a lot of very short-lived empires, you know, these kingdoms who they, they go as fast as they can and they build as fast and they conquer as fast as they can, but they're only ever seeing right in front of them. They don't have a long-term vision for how they can actually pull this off and how they could sustain it. Then you have a counterexample of that, which is Augustus Caesar. Uh, he reigned from 63 BC to 14 AD in ancient Rome. Um, Augustus, or originally known as Octavian, uh, he came to power and he didn't just care about ruling today. He was thinking about generations, generations, generations in the future. Uh, because of this, he did some things really well. Um, now, Rome was a, a crazy place. It's not somewhere where you would want to go back in time and live, but in his historical context, he was not just thinking about his reign, but he was thinking about the reign of his heir and his heir's heir. And so he had succession plans put in place and he reformed the government where there was interplay between the emperor and the Senate, some, some form of checks and balances. Um, he really instituted the Pax Romana, uh, that this era of peace, knowing that if you didn't have peace inside of your empire, that it would be turbulent and eventually it would become undone. It requires vision, living with the end in mind. This is what Stephen Covey wrote in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He says you have to begin with the end in mind. And we say a lot at Metachurch, you have to live with the end in mind, that you have to make today's decisions based on what is going to benefit you, not today, but one year from now or one decade from now or three generations from now. And we live in the culture of instant gratification. And so we have this idea that you can't take a five-year gap and not be championship contenders in the NBA. You got to win and you got to win right now. Four of the last six championship teams in the last six years have fired their head coaches. Like they just took them to the championship. And they're just getting rid of them right away because they didn't get back right away. They didn't climb the mountain right away. Neither did the Spurs. The Spurs won in 99. They didn't win again until I think 03. You know, that's a gap. Like in today's NBA, Popovich would have gotten fired. Like you can't go a four-year gap after you win a championship anymore. And it's, it is this really truncated view, no vision. We just want immediate results, immediate gratification. And you can get away with it sometimes. Uh, you look at the Lakers today. They, they were able to attract LeBron. LA can attract these people like San Antonio can't, man. We're, we're considered a small market team. You know, we don't have Hollywood. We don't have the celebrity culture. We don't, we don't have, we actually, uh, like, to be for real, if people figured out what all San Antonio has, everyone would move here because we have all the shopping. We have all of the cool restaurants. We've got the environments. We have all the stuff. Uh, but people don't know that. And so people, you can get people to LA. You can get stars. You can attract them. And they did win. Now, they won in the bubble season. So I'm going to put a little asterisk on that, you know. But they got them. Uh, they got AD. They brought them in. They got it done. What have they done since? Missed the playoffs. Uh, right now, they're down 0-3 to the Nuggets. No team has ever come back. Now, if he comes back, I'm going to come on this podcast and do a whole thing about LeBron, okay? And it will hurt my heart. But they're probably going to be out of the playoffs again this year. So it's not a dynasty. It's not what the Spurs did. And they're changing coaches over in L.A. They're changing players. They're rotating their roster all of the time. Um, it's not a long-form vision. Many things can lead to a short season of victory. You can have the right money. Uh, you can have the allure of celebrity. Uh, you can have a, a dynamic leader. Uh, who has short-term vision, not dynastic vision, um, but it requires vision. And there's some things that vision gives you. Uh, first, I, I just want you to see like the results of what this like ray of hope has done in San Antonio. I meant to show this at the beginning. I love this video. You've probably seen it, but if you haven't seen this video yet, man, you have to see th this is the moment that San Antonio actually got the first pick in the draft. And this is at a sports bar where I promised they would have been this excited anyway. When we got the first pick, I had to run a lap around my house. It was like we won the championship. But this isn't a sports bar where they had said, if we get the first pick, everyone's tab is getting picked up. Here's some, some San Antonio locals. 
I mean, popping champagne, going, going insane. This is what it looks like when we actually win the championship. This was the like the stakes that we're riding on on this decision. Not only is this like very indicative of how San Antonio feels about our Spurs, um, but if you went downtown, everyone was just driving the streets, honking their horns. Same thing we do after we we win championships. It was amazing. And so, what does it look like to have vision, and what does that offer you? Um, I want us to look at a few scriptures. Um, one of the dynasties that came from Israel, although due to sin, it ended up being not as long lived as it should have been, uh, came from the Davidic uh, legacy. David did not hand the kingdom off to his firstborn son. Instead, he handed it off to his son Solomon. And in 1 Kings 3, let me see, 1 Kings 3, we read, At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon answered, You've shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You've continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? I, I want to point out what's happening here. The Lord appeared to Solomon and said, ask for whatever you want me to give you, whatever you want me to give you. And he says, give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between wrong and right. And the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you've asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment, wisdom, in other words, I will do what you've asked. I'll give you a wise and discerning heart. Moreover, I will give you what you've not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime, you will have no equal among kings. So you can have whatever you want. This is like a, a genie giving one wish. I mean, God really does come down and lay it on like that. Like you can have anything that you want to have. And he says, give me wisdom. Um, wisdom is required to have vision because the wise answer is to make sacrifices today for the betterment of tomorrow. The wise answer is to work incredibly hard today, knowing you might not see the result for three or four years. The, the wise answer is to not compromise short-term pleasure in compromising long-term success and a dynastic type vision. And, you know, I mean, Solomon is a young man. He could have asked for anything. He could have said, give me all of the money, defeat all of my enemies, give me all of the power, give me all the status, give me all the influence. And he asks for wisdom because status and money and influence without vision, without wisdom can be very, very short-lived. We also see something that comes out of great vision, um, which is the power of mentorship. In Deuteronomy 6, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. And here's what I want you to pay attention to. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Uh, vision doesn't just say take care of something right here, right now, today. Vision says this is a long-term exercise. You have to have the mentorship handed down. And, you know, in Psalm 133.1, it says, how good and pleasant is, is it? When brothers dwell in unity, this is talking about having a, a kingdom, a dynasty where there is peace, uh, like Augustus Caesar tried with the Pax Romana, like Israel was when it was living under God's grace. There was peace and people wanted to be there and people were attracted to it. And you can talk all day about how San Antonio is a small market and no stars want to be here. But Tim Duncan is from the Virgin Islands and Tony Parker is from France and Manu Ginobili are, is from Argentina. All of them played here. They were the big three. They helped run the dynasty and they've all made San Antonio a second home. They all hang around here. They all still have homes here. They didn't, they didn't move to the glitz and glamour of the coasts. They stayed here in San Antonio. And as a matter of fact, uh, Wimby is coming in, the number one draft pick that we're going we're gonna to pick up. If we, do not, if we do not actually draft him, um, I'm, I'm going to delete my whole YouTube channel. It's all over. I will be depressed. I will be in hiding. Not really, but we're going we're, we're gonna to get him. And when he comes in, they've already said the whole big three, three Hall of Famers, Tim Duncan, Manu, Tony Parker, they'll all be mentoring this guy. That's the power of vision. They know they lived in the dynasty for 20 years. They know the vision. They know the culture. There is unity. 
that they live in. There is mentorship that is passed down. There is wisdom in the leadership. All of these things come out of a big vision. Uh, at the end of it, vision is living with the end in mind. I want to try to wrap this up by combining these two different metaphors. Uh, the first is the metaphor of pounding the rock. Um, I don't know if it's still there, but famously, when you walked into the Spurs facility, there was a, a, a saying that was in all of the languages that the players on the team spoke. And it says, when nothing seems to help, I go look at a stone cutter hammering away at his rock, perhaps a hundred times without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet at the hundred and first blow, it will split in two. And I know it was not that blow that did it, but all that had gone before. When nothing seems to help, Man, when I run out of patience, when I'm tired of working so hard, uh, when I lose when I lose hope for the future, I think about the stone cutter just hammering away a hundred times at the stone and nothing happening. And all of a sudden, at hammer 101, it splits in half. And, and you know, it wasn't just that one hit. It was all of the hard work that went before. So that is staying focused on today. Keep, you know, Jesus says, uh, keep your hand to the plow and your eyes on the horizon when you are sowing your field. And anyone who looks to the right or to the left is not fit for the kingdom of God. Keep your eyes on the end goal. Live with the end in mind. Have vision for yourself. And that kind of vision allows you to keep your hand to the plow. It allows you to keep hammering away and hammering away and hammering away. And the Spurs were one of the first teams that would say, trust the process. Trust the process. We don't win a championship every year, but we are good every year and we win, we win championships a lot. Trust the process. Trust the culture. Trust the wisdom. Trust the mentorship. Trust the unity. Pounding the rock is one metaphor I want to hold. The other is uh, an apocryphal story. Uh, many many say it's actually rooted in something true, which is uh, the story of the three bricklayers. In 1666, there was a great fire in London, and um, Christopher Wren, he was like the world's most famous architect, he was uh, you know, put to the task of remaking this great cathedral. And the story goes that one day Christopher Wren went and he saw three different bricklayers all on the same scaffolding a little ways apart from each other. And he asked them all the same question. What are you doing? And the first one said, well, I am a, a bricklayer. I'm laying bricks so I can feed my family. He asked the second bricklayer, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm a builder and I'm, I'm building this building. And he asked the third bricklayer, what are you doing? And the third bricklayer said, I am a cathedral builder. I am building a great cathedral to God Almighty. I'm a bricklayer. That is like the lowest level of vision. That is the, the lowest clarity, LCD. And then you have the medium, which is like, I'm a builder. It's not just, you know, what I'm doing, but it's, it's, uh, it's what I'm doing at a, at, at a more macro level. And then you have the third guy who is leagues beyond them. The third guy has vision. He's doing the same exact task. He's pounding the rock. He's laying the bricks. He's doing the work, but he has a vision for it. And he says, I'm a cathedral builder, and I am building this cathedral to God Almighty. This is worship. This is offering. This is sacrifice. My hands will have laid the bricks that created this beautiful, massive structure designed by the greatest architect on earth. And so how do you build a dynasty time and time again? You have to have vision. You have to live with the end in mind. You have to have enough focus on your bigger goal, on, on what is ahead of you, that you're willing to make the sacrifices every day. You can't just be a bricklayer. You have to be a cathedral builder, worshiping with your work. And having that scale of a vision will allow you to keep pounding the rock and pounding the rock and trusting the process. Big vision for your future keeps you focused on the task at hand today, trusting the process, trusting wisdom, trusting in unity, trusting in mentorship. And if you can have that level of big vision, then you, like the Spurs, can build a dynasty. And even when there are lulls and even when there are dips, you can contain and continue this dynasty into the future.